Now you, you know, rose up the ranks uh, of the Black Panther Party. So you ended up becoming the, the field secretary? Yes, field secretary for the New York chapter. Okay, and what was your responsibility as a field secretary of the Black Panthers? A field secretary had to deal with, um, with, with working with the um, organizers for the party and the cadres for the party that were dispersed, that were in a particular general area. And, um, and meeting with them, resolving contradictions and, and stuff like that. Also, uh, I had to do the regular run out to the airport to get the newspaper, which was a primary uh, task of the party, was the distribution of the Panther newspaper. And, um, and we had a lot of problems with that because uh, the FBI had a problem, had a, um, a program to, to sabotage the distribution of the newspaper. And uh, so they would misdirect uh, uh, freight, the, the, the delivery, they would uh, uh, held, hold it up at the airport and put it through certain, you know, put us through all of these changes just to get the newspaper. So that, that became a task in and of itself. So I was responsible for, uh, for dealing with that in the early stages of our organization in New York. How, how did you know Feeney Shakur during this time? When she first showed up in Harlem and joined the party. She started coming to the political education classes, community classes, um, and, um, and she took um, her and Lumumba Shakur uh, became um, uh, friends and comrades, very close friends, and, and um, that's how she got the last name Shakur, because she ended up um, with an Afri African marriage to a Lumumba Shakur. So explain to me the whole Panther 21 situation. They were accusing you guys of trying to bomb three locations, and also they had found like uh, rifles and so forth. Well, they, they, because they couldn't find any material evidence to support a bomb plot, um, they didn't have any material evidence to that. What they had done it's like I said, you know, they had infiltrated um, um, the security section, but you know, there were, there were other agents in the Black Panther Party, and the agents didn't know each other were agents. You know, they didn't, and so you had a situation in the Panther Party in New York where agents were actually reporting the actions of other agents for another agency as if, you know, this was some individual who was planning something. And, and of course, the agency is trying to get us to do, to do provocative stuff. You see, so if, if, if the Bureau of Special Services, for instance, has an informer inside of a particular branch and he's sitting in a political education me meeting and there's an FBI informer there talking about we need to kill cops, he's going to, you know, report back, you know, uh, so and so and so at a meeting said that we need to kill cops. You know, now, of course, the bossy people don't know that this is an FBI agent that said this, so it gets attributed to the group. You see, and, and this particular individual. And that's what they did. They, 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 entered, they had one of these individuals um, um, uh, who was working with Lumumba Shakur in the, in the Ellesmere Tenant Association. We worked with tenants, as I said before, and we were working in a tenant association. He infiltrated that to work with uh, Lumumba Shakur, and, and you know, he brought um, dynamite. To, to, to the Ellesmere Tenant Association um, because he began to hatch a plot about how we, sh we should be blowing up the police station and, and, and this police station couldn't, you know, he went and checked it out and, um, and, and this police station was ripe for this, that, and the other. And so he reports back that, you know, that, 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 um, that they need explosives for this, for these, for this plot. And he brought the explosives there. He planted it there, but they were inert. They were inert material. They weren't really explosives. They were inert material, and that's the stuff that they arrested us for. They arrested when they raided us. They, did you have to understand? This was a secret indictment. The, the, the grand jury was sitting in secret, and and um, and because of the agents telling them that we were planning to do this, all of this stuff on Easter on Easter holidays to do all of this stuff, they felt that they had to come back with an indictment and arrest us right away. This is what they said, right? And um, so the first place they went to, of course, was where they went and got this, this phony dynamite. And of course, we were members of the Black Panther Party, so to expect us to have um, our homes and our houses not defended or not have um, our arms to defend ourselves was pretty ludicrous. So the weapons that they got 
from our, from our individual apartments didn't constitute the type of arsenal that would, you know, that would, that, that would be employed to carry out this grand 200 count conspiracy. You know, to ambush police and blow up department stores, blow up the train stations. You know, shoot, shoot, uh, uh, shoot up City Hall or Wall Street. All of these accounts in the indictment. You see. So, but when they raided our houses, the most they could come up with was a few pistols, a few, um, a few assault rifles, and that was it. And so they had to go with that. And um, and so. This is, you know, they would try to amplify this in the media, like this is the stuff that we had. But the, but the most um, uh, uh, damning uh, evidence that they had was these phony, phony explosives. This was the only thing that spoke to the conspiracy. And it was the police that introduced the explosives. It wasn't us. And that came out in the trial, and I think that that was one of the main reasons we were acquitted. Right. So I guess there was 156 charges. Yes, yeah, something And like all that. of them were dropped. Yes, well, we, we, yeah, we, we, were all, we were acquitted on all charges. They actually went to the jury, and the jury read 156 times not guilty. So, yeah. And, and they came to that conclusion in 45 minutes after sitting, for trial, sitting in a trial for almost eight months. Right. This was actually the most expensive trial in New York State history at the time. Yeah, at that time. The longest and the most expensive. And, and, and people don't know it, but that, you know, I mean, we know it now, but the, the, the uh, district attorney and the, and the judge used to meet after court every day to determine how they were going to handle the case the next day. They would meet in private, sit down, you know, kick the willy over, over some coffee and a drink and say, so now how are we going to help handle these, these jigaboos next time? You know, and uh, he says, well, this is what I'm thinking. And so what they did in, in the trial all of the evidence that they submitted was already vetted by the judge before he even made a decision in the case officially from the bench. Like, for instance, in our trial, um, I, you know, this is something I've been telling the young folks in Black Lives Matter today. One of the things that they did in our trial is they introduced a movie in our trial. Um, you might have seen it, The Battle of Algiers. It's a dramatic movie, but it's filmed in, a, in, in black and white as a documentary of the Algerian uh, um, uh, um, uprising, the Algerian uh, Re Revolutionary War to overthrow the uh, French. And they used this movie, they introduced it as evidence in the Panther 21 trial, and they used it in our, against us to say this was a training film that we used in the community to recruit criminals and people off of the streets and, and transform them into revolutionaries, okay? And, and therefore, it was relevant to the conspiracy, that we were conspiring to do these things, and this was our training film. And the judge allowed it into the court. And, and yeah, and the jury watched the movie. They obviously liked the movie because they acquitted us. But <laughs> they weren't terrified. But, but I mean, this is how the judge was thinking. The, the judge and, and the DA were thinking that once they see these, these North Africans killing Frenchmen and blowing things up, you know, that they would associate one with, associate that with us, and one and one would make 11, right? And, uh, and instead, one and one made two to the jury. And, and they came back in 45 minutes and acquitted us. And when they were asked about the movie, they said that it was, um, it was, a, it was an eye opener, because they didn't know that, anything about the Algerian Revolution. And it taught them a lot about <laughs> the decolonization of, of Algeria, which they didn't know. And you got to remember, these people were stupid people. These people were, some of these people were professionals, some of these people were doctors, some of these people were, uh, I mean, these were, these were very intelligent people. Uh, some of them were, uh, one guy was a literary editor or something. So these were people that were, these were discerning people. You know, and it was, and, and um, so they didn't buy the concocted conspiracy theory from the very beginning. It fell apart from the very beginning. And, um, and they were waiting for the evidence. And they just waited and waited and waited. And evidence never really came. You know, so, and that's what they said. They said, you know, there was no compelling evidence. And, and, and the reason why I bring up the, 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 the Battle of Algiers is because now we have the same, the state trying to do the same thing. When, whenever uh, 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 folks like black folks, Black Lives Matter, uh, whenever they confront 
law enforcement and, and the state uh, uh, for not being accountable for, um, for, for murdering and, and devout, murdering black people and devaluing uh, black lives. You know, that when they talk about self-defense, when we talk about this, um, this, this issue of self-defense, the, the conversation is always convoluted and flipped over to black on black crime, the, uh, the need to get guns out to the community, how, um, how you know, the, the, the individual shooters, the people who shot the police in Dallas, or the people that shoot back at the cops are basically criminals, they're basically thugs, they're, they're, um, they're the dregs of society, and, and all of these things. And now when we examine all of these facts, we come to find out that this is disinformation. That the individuals, for instance, the individual that they claim was the lone, and, and he's always a lone shooter. It's always someone who's crazy, who's unhinged, who has this uh, um, irrational hatred of white people and of law enforcement, and this is why they did what they did, you see? And this is exactly how they tried to portray us to the, to the jury. What do you think about the whole situation? Man, my point of view, man, I really feel like they tried to paint a bad picture on my brother and try to make him look like like he was a hater uh, it was some envy jealousy type shit you know what I'm saying and actuality you know what I'm saying bro been having this shit man he been in the condo I got my hat on and I had my coke bottles up under my hat and I'm sitting at the dinner table like an asshole with the hat on knowing she gonna tell me to take it off and I'm just sitting there just Garping down, you know, in my zone. She said, take that goddamn hat off at the dinner table. I'm like, come on, mom. Coat everywhere. 